to you guys a little bit about the development of Hong Kong Coast Pottinger. Yes. Um, so, you, uh, please feel free, I think it's okay, if you want to ask a question at any time, what do you do? Raise your hand. Put your hand up and just wait to be asked. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Feel free to interrupt me any time with, uh, with a raise of hand. Okay. Um, the Lion Rock Institute is a public policy think tank in which uh, we sit down and think about what kind of policies the government should or should not. Uh, in place because the Landmark Institute believes that the, in a in a functioning state oh nice t-shirt by the way I went to that university. Uh, <laughs> I'll be very quick with the fundamentals. There are two types of states in the world. There are functioning and there are failed states. We deal with the functioning state and the way that we define functioning state is according to a German philosopher, Max Weber. He says that in the functioning state, there is only one monopoly power of coercion. There truly is only one particular entity that can make you do things against your wishes, and that's the government. In a failed state, in contrast, there could be multiple, or there could be none. If there are none, then there's auto, um, anarchy. If there are multiple uh, uh, coercive forces, like in Afghanistan, if you're a village in Afghanistan, during the day, the American army arrives. All the males of the village are asked to come out. If you refuse to come out, bad things will happen to you. And at night, when the Taliban comes to your village, ask for food, and refuse to give it to them, you also have bad things happen to you. When a place of two or more coercive forces acting on you, it becomes a failed state. So the Lion Rock Institute deals with a functioning state. Okay? Only one. Monopoly power coercion. See, these things are tough. This particular term is tough. But imagine having dinner with your parents and their friends. And then we get into a question, you know, a debate or discussion of politics. And you throw a line like this out at them. They would be speechless. And you think that uh, the tuition that you're paying at the French International School is absolutely paying off. Alright? But this is the, I promise this is the only boring bit of the, of the talk. Because uh, Hong Kong has always been known as the freest economy of the world. And uh, at your age, a lot of my peers and myself began to form certain political beliefs. And I became a free marketeer slash libertarian. How many of you would classify yourself as a free marketeer? Can I just interrupt? Just Hands up if you if you're doing or if you've done economics, either IGCSE or IB level. Okay. No worries. I'll I'll come back to that. How many of you guys would call yourself a socialist? No. How many of you are not really sure? Can I just can I just interrupt? Neo maybe neo Keynesian or neo classical rings more bells for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. Because this, is, this particular talk, this particular talk, is all about throwing all those labels away. To understand why Hong Kong is so free, we have to go all the way back to our first government in the British colonial era. The British were very good with their propaganda. They were very good at telling the people of Hong Kong in subsequent generations what kind of contributions they made to Hong Kong. One of the most famous propaganda. Because I went to island school in the later colonial ages. And back then, we had a course called Community Course, when I was in year seven, to teach me and my classmates about basically the contributions British made to Hong Kong. And one of the first terms that I came across is that Hong Kong, when the British first came in 1840, was called a barren rock. It was like the British was, I don't want to use this term because I know it's a French school, and it's, you know, it's uh, not religious, but it's like they were gods. There was nothing there. And then the British came, and then boom, suddenly this economic miracle happened. That was basically the British again. But behind 
this particular work, what we cannot deny was there is nothing before the British came. It was truly this very small fishing village. And in fact, during the last dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty, because of rampant piracy, the Qing courts actually wanted all Chinese to move at least many miles away from the coast. And Hong Kong being at the coast, many of the Hong Kong's uh, inhabitants before the British came was actually moved away. So there was really nothing. So how did this particular miracle, economic miracle, came by? And a lot of people said, of course, because of the economic freedom. Right? And there were three rules in 1840. Pottinger was the guy, well, he's not only the first, there's a street, there's by the way, named after him. Okay? Pottinger Street in Central. Okay? Right, Pottinger. He was the guy who actually defied London orders. He said he received a telegram too late. He was actually ordered by London not to take Hong Kong. But he said, oops, I'm sorry, you want, me, you want me to give it back? So London said, fine, keep it. But by taking Hong Kong, they faced a huge challenge. Okay? Hong Kong's freedom can be all the way, the DNA of Hong Kong freedom can go all the way back to him because he came up with three rules. Number one rule, no taxes. Two, free port to trade, and this is very important, including enemies of the British Empire. So everyone can come and trade. And three, respect local customs. You would say, well, one, one, one of these things. No tax is very simple. There are no direct taxes. You don't have to pay income tax, you don't have to pay property tax. The government raised revenue most directly from giving out licenses. If you want to do a business, you have to get a license. Also, if you, have, uh, if you want to lease a piece of land from the government, you have to pay rent. That was the government's biggest income. On the free port, anyone can come and do business in Hong Kong, something that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. And three, respecting local customers. So, the British today, when asked, well, why did Henry Pottinger set up these three rules? They would say that, well, you know, during the times in 1840s in London, there was an enlightenment movement going on. You know, people like Wilberforce was fighting against noble slavery. Uh, the Economist, the, the newspaper, the magazine was founded to fight against uh, trade protectionism in Britain. But those were really lofty ideas back in London. Back now here in the colonies, we are talking about really hard-nosed governing practitioners. People who are simply interested in one thing, which is to maintain control of Hong Kong on behalf of Queen Victoria. Even 10 years after taking Hong Kong in 1850, the population of Hong Kong was about 100,000. There was less than 1,000. Caucasians, quite deep in Hong Kong. With that kind of percentage, they were only interested in control. So why these people? In fact, Hong Kong was so hard as a place to recruit British civil servants that British parents in the Victorian era, when their children misbehaved, they would say, if you keep on misbehaving, I will send you to Hong Kong. That was how far Hong Kong was. And in fact, if you look at the map, back then the Suez Canal wasn't actually open. Does anyone know what the Suez Canal is? Right? The Suez Canal wasn't actually open. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the battle fleet that protected Hong Kong was based in a city called Plymouth. And Plymouth is a city at the mouth of a river called Tamar River. In fact, the government headquarters on Tamar right now is named after that particular river. But if you were to sail a battle fleet at the beginning of Hong Kong's history, or well, colonial history, you have to go past Spain, Africa, round South Africa, cut all the way across the Indian Ocean, and across Singapore, and then back to Hong Kong. So it was extremely hard to recruit people to come to Hong Kong and to serve the Queen. And hence these new rules. 
Direct taxes like income tax and profit tax is extremely labor intensive, is extremely intrusive. You have to find out someone well, how much you make. And in fact, if someone starts lying and not caught, then other people will start lying as well. So both income tax and profit tax is extremely hard to levy if you don't have enough civil servants. So knowing that, the British said, you know what, we're not even going to try it, levy that kind of taxes. Two, it takes about, well before this race for now especially, it takes about months for a battle fleet to sail to Hong Kong. And in order to reduce the amount of soldiers you have to place in Hong Kong, you want to reduce the incentives for your enemies to attack you. And attacking anywhere costs money. So the British figured out, if I was to say anyone can come here to buy whatever they want, they won't attack us. In fact, in the eve of uh, the Second World War, well, according to you, when did the Second World War start? 1939. 1937. 1937. Any other versions? 38. Well, the acceptable version, there are three acceptable versions to this particular answer. 1937, 1939, and 1942. Or 41. It depends who you are. If you are Chinese, that's when Japan invaded China, 1937. If you are European, that's when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. But if you're American, that's when Poland invaded Poland. So it's really easy to say what kind of school education someone went to if you ask them when the Second World War started. They give you one of these dates and roughly know what kind of school system they went to. But the key was in 1941, Japan didn't just attack Pearl Harbor. In fact, simultaneously, troops were actually marching into Hong Kong as well from across the Chinzen River. But then we are a day late because Hawaii was actually behind the international dateline. So when the bombs were going off in Pearl Harbor, this, when the soldiers were marching into Hong Kong, Hong Kong was already, I think it was the 9th of December, or they were the 8th of December. But it was happening at the same time. Okay? Japanese conducted four operations that day were the attack in Hong Kong. And in fact, it was the British who thought, the Japanese lacked oil. If you went to the Japanese Imperial War Museum, next to their uh, shrine that worships the war dead, the one thing that they accumulated massively before the Second World War was oil. And the British thought, well, if we allow the Japanese to buy oil, then they're going to attack us. But unfortunately, they miscalculated, and the Japanese did attack. Alright? So anyway, the third one respecting local customs. Local customs back then, Chinese customs, included things like, obviously, eating dogs and cats, polygamy, uh, one husband, multiple wives. Uh, really harsh, torture system in the criminal courts. But the British, even though they were massively enlightened and believed in bringing their law systems everywhere, still left this untouched. Because once you start trying to change what the locals did, you once again re require massive amounts of police officers and judges. So the British completely designed their system to reduce the amount of personnel they had in Hong Kong. But the unintended consequence is because of this massive freedom in down to Hong Kong. Because the British ran places, their, their empire, the sun never set in their empire, right? But Hong Kong is uniquely free simply because of the fact that we didn't have enough people to run Hong Kong. And the unintended consequence is the prosperity that we see today. Could I ask, uh, is there any, any place that you associate as being similar to Hong Kong, where the same kind of freedoms may or may not exist? Similarly, economic development would be Singapore. And would that, is that Singapore would, would have had the civil service, they would have had? They would have a little, little bit more, but their free port uh, characteristic, I think, was smaller, especially in the late 19th century. The, the main reason is because they were surrounded by fewer enemies. Hong Kong, if you think about it, had the Qing courts in China. They had Japan. They had all the other foreign powers all circling around this area. Hong Kong was uniquely, into 1997, uh, a place that was taken by accident and remained British by accident. In fact, the second rule, my father always said that James Bond is a hoax. 
the entire concept of James Bond as a hoax. Because there is a very famous Hong Kong business person called Henry Falk. His claim to fame is that during the Korean War, when the United Nations placed an embargo on the People's Republic of China, back in the New Territories, this Henry Falk ran a massive smuggling operations of medicine, supposedly of medicine, and civilian goods. But so uh, rumor has it he ran a lot of uh, ammunitions and other uh, firearms. Okay? And my father always said that if James Bond was real, Henry Falk would have never did his business. But then one of my friends at the Royal Rock Institute reminded me it was because of this free port idea that allowed, the, well, not allowed him, but at least let the British refrain themselves from intervening with Henry Falk. Because in 1949, when the People's Republic of China was founded, if they wanted to, they could have marched into China and taken Hong Kong back. But with that one Korean war that happened in 1951-52, it demonstrated to the People's Republic of China's highest powers that keeping Hong Kong as a British colony was helpful to them. Or else they would have, they could have taken it any time they wanted to. In fact, that was also why Britain was one of the first countries to recognize China, Beijing China. It took the Americans until the 1970s to recognize Beijing China. Before 1972, Washington DC recognized Taipei as the, uh, as the true government of China. Okay? But to fast forward to 1982. 1982. In 1982, the negotiations between Hong Kong and, or well, the negotiations between China and Britain over Hong Kong started. It might seem ancient history to you. But uh, Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister, went to Beijing, had the first meeting. They basically, she basically shook hands and she said, I had to go. Because Deng Xiaoping received her and said, Madam Prime Minister, welcome to China. Uh, I know you're here to negotiate about Hong Kong's future. We're taking it back. You talk, to the, you talk to the details with my uh, premier, Tatsuya, and Deng Xiaoping just left at the same time. So Mother Thatcher thought all kinds of possibilities was possible, but with Deng Xiaoping saying that, she said, I need to think about it. She left the room at the Great Hall in Beijing. There were these very long steps, and in front of hundreds of cameras, she fell. And the moment she fell, just before the moment she fell, it only took five Hong Kong dollars to buy one US dollar. Within two weeks of her falling, it fell to ten Hong Kong dollars. It basically depreciated in half. There was massive panic in Hong Kong. And one of the uh, rumors contained in many memoirs, actually, of people involved in negotiations, was Margaret Thatcher actually went to Deng Xiaoping and said, well, could we extend the lease of Hong Kong? And lots of Hong Kong people today, in fact, this particular discussion comes up over and over again with, between your parents and your parents' friends. They would say, hey, you know what? Margaret Thatcher actually asked China whether they can extend the lease. And all these people think that that's a really crazy idea. I mean, she must be idiotic to think that. But if you think from this particular perspective, if the Chinese wanted to take Hong Kong, they could have done so 50 years prior to 1997. They didn't have to wait until 1997. But Hong Kong had demonstrated time and time again to be of use as a British colony to mainland China. And therefore, Margaret Thatcher thought that could be a possibility. And even Deng Xiaoping himself thought Hong Kong keeping its way of life is very important to China's development. But then, instead of keeping it as a British colony, we came up with a concept. Do it because. 
because he thought that it would be a cool thing for the people of Hong Kong to enjoy. Come on. He's a communist. He fought many wars. Does he really care about how people actually get him and think and know? He actually introduced this because he knew that if Hong Kong remained a common law jurisdiction, a free market economy, it would be helpful for the development of China. And why is the development of China so important? Well, basically, Deng Xiaoping didn't do what he did in the early 19, or in the late 1970s and early 1980s. China today will be like North Korea. It will be on the verge of collapse. China's GDP was the biggest in the world after the Roman Empire until about the Industrial Revolution in the UK. It had the biggest GDP in the world. But then by 1975, 76, it decreased all the way to about 2 or 3% of global GDP. It was on the verge of being wiped out. We're talking about having one-fifth of humanity, but only 2% of the GDP. So Deng Xiaoping had to change. And Margaret Thatcher thought that, well, we needed help. Hong Kong would be a great help, so let us keep Hong Kong. But that didn't happen. Can I ask, Andrew, if, if 1997 as a date hadn't ever existed, you know, if the British had negotiated a indefinite lease of Kowloon and uh, new territories, do you think Deng Xiaoping would be happy to just leave Hong Kong to carry on as is? I would think that Deng Xiaoping would have, but uh, by 2015, they would have sort of taken it back. Um, any questions so far? Where does the opium war fit into this? Oh, the, the, uh, hmm, this is a very interesting question. What's your question? What's your question? If you say the British have taken Hong Kong by accident, what do you think about the Treaty of Peking and Nanking signed uh, after the First and Second Opium War? Hmm, sure. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the historian that I, well, he's my idol, okay, there is a historian that's my idol, called now Ferguson. Okay. Well, anyway, he's great, I use lots of YouTube videos. But anyways, in his book, in his book, War of the World, he simply, he asked a very simple question. He said that in the 20th century was humans' most successful century. The average human's income went by four or six times. What they can consume has increased even more because of technology. Yet 20th century was also the bloodiest century. Right? There were massive killings, genocides everywhere. But the question he asked was, why was these killings concentrated in certain areas? Why wasn't there massive killings in Sweden or Argentina? Why did it happen a couple of times in Yugoslavia, Cambodia, China, Ukraine? And the, well, his observation was that you have to have three factors. The first one is that you have to have ethnic conflict. Number two, borders, moving borders. The Opium War. The British was basically expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. The, the boundary of the British Empire basically touched every single other empire in the world. And if they touched an empire that was weak, like the one in China, massive bloodshed would happen. And at the end, the British would take what they wanted. And back to the question of whether if they, if they had taken in perpetuality, right? If Hong Kong was taken forever. Well, not, not in perpetuality, but if there was not that date. Of the end of the lease, right? The uh, because of China's itself growing in the late 1980s and late 1990s, assuming that that was the only difference, with the emergence of China, Chinese would have figured out we were taking Hong Kong back, and what would happen to us is exactly what happened to Macau. Macau was a Portuguese colony for for, for over 400 years, and at the end, the Portuguese shrank back, and the Chinese expanded and took Macau back. Right? So my question about how the opium, the opium war was simply when empire borders were moving, opium was simply an item that enabled, or at least was the symptom of that particular, I wouldn't call it disease, but that was the momentum at the end 
you know, you see earthquakes, but is the uh, molten lava and magma that's moving on the entire borders that created the Opium War. You can't really, you, I, I wouldn't say, oh, it was because the Chinese was addicted to opium and British, British was selling the opium to China and therefore Hong Kong became a British colony. It was because the British was basically expanding everywhere and they simply needed an excuse. And the excuse in this particular case happened to be opium. Right? Any other questions? No. But this is a very interesting point. Because what you see in Hong Kong right now, I would say that you have the genesis, the beginning of something that could be very bad. Okay? Because the uh, Ferguson said genocide means three particular ingredients. Ethnic conflict. Even if two groups of people are living together side by side, if you look at simple statistics, like are they marrying each other? Are they working with each other? Do they even dress like each other? They can be completely sort of alike. But if you were to ask one member of one group to identify a member of the other group, and there are then conflicts happening. And if you ask one group of individuals to describe the other group, they would call them in German Untermesh, which is subhumans, is what the Nazis used. Okay? The second thing is happening moving borders of empire. When Deng Xiaoping thought of one country, two systems in Hong Kong, he thought that he could perpetuate the system we had in Hong Kong for 50 years until 2047. But if you were to look at 2015, today, what has happened in the last 18, 17 years? The way of life in Hong Kong is changing. Okay? So, in effect, Hong Kong's, well, Hong Kong used to be the border of British Empire, and Deng Xiaoping wanted to kick that can down the road for them. Because of neglect, I would say neglect, it's starting to move. And on the question of ethnic conflict, there is now a very big political confrontation going on. If you do get the chance to talk politics with your parents and parents' friends, with the locals, the number one overriding political issue nowadays in Hong Kong is mainland Hong Kong conflict. It trumps everything. It trumps poverty, global warming, democracy. Democracy, I think, is merely an extension of this particular conflict. Hong Kong people, unfortunately, calls mainlanders what? Does anyone know what term they use? Parasite? Is it parasite? Close. Locus. That's it, who said that? <laughs> right. Locus! And what does the uh, well, so called, quote unquote, blue ribbons call the yellow ribbons? Who were the blue ribbons? Anti or pro Beijing, China. So, the pro establishment types calls the yellow ribbons, the, uh, the troublemakers, dogs. And the, uh, the yellow, yellow ribbons, the uh, democracy fighters, are calling the, uh, the Beijing you know, lackeys, locusts. So you already see the beginnings of this viewing the other side as subhuman. But unfortunately, if you look at examples from places like Yugoslavia, Cambodia, Ukraine, with this particular view of the other side, for some reason, sexual violence has to always be involved. In Yugoslavia, for example, even in the 1990s, there were rape camps. Okay? Even though you view the other side as subhuman, for some reason you have to violate the woman. Right? So, we already have the two ingredients of massive pleasure in Hong Kong. The third one. Ferguson calls it economic volatility. I explain it to our members of the Lion Rock Institute as a lot of money has been lost, but we don't know who has to eat that loss yet. For example, there is a massive pocket property speculation in the hall. When it's going up, everyone's making money. When it starts going down, what would happen? If 
first of all, a lot of homeowners are going to lose money. But homeowners only lose as much as they put down. If they put down, say, half a million dollars to buy a one million dollar flat, they will only lose half a million. But the one million dollar flat was to go down to 300,000. Who's going to eat the other ones? If the homeowner borrowed money from a bank, the bank has to make that loss. But then if the bank, who's done banking theory here? Everyone, right? Well, no, we don't really touch on that. Okay. But anyways, banks basically take the deposits in and then lend people money. Right? If people don't repay the banks, the depositors start losing money. Okay? So when there are depositors, well, when there are not enough money to get back to the depositors, you have a banking crisis. And when you have a banking crisis together with these two particular ingredients, all you need now is like a demagogue who would incite ethnic hate and ethnic violence, and this particular demagogue would usually get the blame for everything while ignoring the fundamental trends that's happening in that society. But once you have that, things can move very quickly. Right? Sarajevo. Anyone knows where Sarajevo is? Right. Sarajevo, 1984, hosted the Winter Olympics. By 1988-89, it was a very peaceful Yugoslavian city. The communist world used it as an example of how enlightened communism can be. Right? It had many, many different ethnic groups living in it. In fact, one week before Serbian forces using artillery shelled Sarajevo, there was a peace rally of over 100,000 people in Sarajevo across all different races asking for peace. One week later, the siege started and the shells started firing again. So things can happen very, very quickly. But the Lion Rock Institute do study these kind of things and try to help solve them. These might be very heavy stuff. There are other small, smaller policies that we look into. For example, how, is, how should electricity be generated in Hong Kong? Some of the stuff. Right? But if you're talking about the very big trends that's happening, because a lot of people talk about geopolitics in the world, but they ignore the geography. Okay? And if you ask me whether Hong Kong can carry on, if Hong Kong can carry on peacefully, There is one big advantage. What is the fundamental driver of human economic progress? Anyone have any ideas? I was taught that in my first class in economics back in year 10. It actually appears on the 20 pound note in the UK. If you have to say it is. One thing makes you rich. One thing makes it rich. <laughs> Your parents would be so proud of you right now. <laughs> no ideas? Well, yes. Just, just forget about that 20 pound note issue. I mean, a driver of growth that we've done. Profit. But of growth. What makes you rich? Money. <laughs> <laughs> I go into the Lionel Institute, within our institute, I would say specialization is what makes humans, you know, you, you focus on what you do best, and you become rich. And you, of course, if you only make one thing, you have to start trading. Hong Kong has the advantage of being at the mouth of a river. Even in this 21st century, moving things on water is the cheapest way of moving things. The second cheapest way, or well, the cheapest way on land of moving things is by train. And even by using cost per ton to move one kilometer, um, water is about one quarter of the cost of moving things by rail. Right? So historically, when you live next to a river, every citizen who lives at the river's edge can specialize in what they're good at. And if the entire river is full of fertile land, then you have high degrees of specializations occurring, and people can start trading, and they become rich. And usually at the mouth of these rivers grows huge financial centers. 
So if you ask me, can Hong Kong keep its prosperity as, Hong, as long as this specialization can take place and Hong Kong remains a free port, then this particular growth can still occur. But you have to, have to, have to, have to remember specialization is the number one driver of human progress. Right? If there's one thing you take away from this, I mean, you can forget about Henry Pottinger and all that stuff. Right? If someone asks you, well, you know, how, how, you know, how, how did the human race get rich? Specialization. The more specializing you get, the richer they become. Okay? So that would be the ultimate, despite all my doom and gloom about Hong Kong, that would be my ultimate. special place because it was British administered on the edge of China and as far as they're concerned it's losing ground now because other Chinese cities are taking over but they're mimicking Hong Kong and now moving ahead of Hong Kong. Uh, any thoughts as to whether that will happen or Charles de Gaulle has said that the Americans have a very heavy burden because the entire world uses the American dollar. Right? But there's also a huge privilege because whenever you print, an, a, basically, paper money is nothing but an IOU. Someone issues you it, you give them something, and then you take it and use it and trade it between yourselves. So if someone gets to print a lot of these IOUs, the person who can print it enjoys a lot of free benefits. Okay? Now, China never really had that ambition. What's the currency of China? The Chinese didn't really have that ambition of turning itself into a reserve currency uh, until about 10 years ago. Okay? Because there was one very, very key event that happened in the late 1990s. In 1997, a dictatorship, a very stable one actually, in fact, in Indonesia, fell because they had a banking crisis. 
that bank spent too much money to be to speculate on all sorts, all sorts of things, and then the economy busted. They can't repay the banks. Banks can't repay the depositors. So the international community took over Indonesia, the IMF, and the Americans, and all that. They're all what the Europeans now look called Troika. Okay. But basically, within a matter of one year, if you went to Indonesia in 1996 and you asked anyone in the streets in Jakarta, how long do you think your government is going to keep ruling? They would say, I don't know, forever. Sort of like going to Shenzhen and ask, when, how long do you think the communists are going to rule in China? But within one or two years, that government, led by a man called Suharto, was gone. So the mainland government saw that and said to themselves, we have to protect ourselves from this particular potential banking crisis. So what they did first was to accumulate a huge amount of foreign reserves. Trillions. Right? Way more than what the Japanese ever did. And everyone thought they were trying to manipulate their currency. Right? Trying to cheapen their exports. But in reality, what they saw was Sahato was removed in a matter of months within the banking crisis. And they thought the only way they can keep themselves in power, if there is a banking crisis, is if they had enough US dollars. That was their thinking. Until 2008. In 2008, America itself had a banking crisis. Right? So the entire world thought, well, what happened in Indonesia would happen to the Americans, which is you have to bankrupt all your banks, reset everything, restart everything, have a massive you know, recession, and then uh, emerge from that like a phoenix. So that was what everyone thought the Americans would do. But no, they decided to print money. And then what happened was they printed so much money, the Chinese thought we tried, we had to trade all of our blood and sweat and cheap labor to accumulate a few trillions of US dollar foreign reserves. And within a few keystrokes of a computer, the American government did the same. So they said to themselves, no, we have to have our own reserve currency. We have to stop using the American dollar. We have to stop relying on the American dollar. And then, what role does Hong Kong have to play in that? If you want other countries to start using your currency, Let's say you're a trader. I mean, the dream scenario would be Saudi Arabia buying cocoa beans from Indonesia but settling the trade in renminbi. If the Saudi Arabians were to take renminbi and buy cocoa beans from Indonesians in renminbi, that would be the dream scenario for the Chinese. But that means the Saudi Arabian bank have to have renminbi available. That means the Indonesian bank have to have renminbi available as well. Right? And banks have a very interesting things they do with money, which is they let it out. But if you have B in both banking system, where can they put that B? And that's where Hong Kong comes in. About seven or eight years ago, Shanghai launched something called Panda Bonds. Panda Bonds are basically bonds issued in Shanghai, basically IOUs, in which banks can buy to park their RMB. If you have RMB in your banking system, come and buy a pound of bonds. But then if you were an Indonesian bank and you saw a bond issued in Shanghai, the first question you always ask when you lend some money, money to someone is, what happens if you don't pay me back? Right? So if someone doesn't pay you back in Shanghai, you take them to court in Shanghai, right? Yes or no? You think you win? So when the Panda Bond launched, no international investor bought them because they simply couldn't trust the, uh, the mainland banking system. So about seven or eight months down the line, the uh, Central Bank of China, together with the finance minister, called down to our financial secretary in Hong Kong and said, you know what, can you do something about this? And uh, financial secretary of Hong Kong, John Tan, called up the bankers and said, hey, there's a new business line. Are you guys interested? And the bankers were like, Wee! Free money! Let's make some money! So on behalf of many Chinese companies, there are now bonds called dim sum bonds. Yes, bank is the family very good name and stuff. These are bonds that borrows the be, but issued in Hong Kong. And suddenly, international take-up through these dim sum bonds went through the roof. 
and you see lots and lots of banking systems in the world now carry these dim sum bonds in their system. When they have RMB, they'll buy these dim sum bonds issued in Hong Kong. And the reason is because they trust the core systems in Hong Kong. They know that if something, if the person issuing the bond doesn't pay you back, you can take them to court in Hong Kong. So back to the question of what role can Hong Kong play, I would say the biggest role Hong Kong play with the rise of China or in the future is the international, internationalization of the RMB. So if your parents and their friends were to talk about this, say, well, Hong Kong is finished. There are no more roles in Hong Kong. You tell them the story about the some bonds and the bonds and say, it's too early to count this out yet. But of course, whether the court system will still be trustworthy going into the future requires the protection of the court system by everyone here. If we don't actually actively try to protect it, then we can't help the rise of trade. At least that's what I tell the mainland, mainland is what I say. Don't try to influence our judges in the way that they rule, because if you do, no one's going to trust the things on Okay? So if there's one thing you want to sound smart in front of your parents and their friends, that is the role of China. That really is the role of Hong Kong and the rest of China. Okay? Yes. If this is the whole role of China, then Hong Kong is going to be an important offshore trading center for RMB bonds. Right. And at the same time, China is developing similar centers in London and Singapore. Yes, but uh, there is a theory behind that because if you look at the vote that will be taking place on Wednesday. Yes, two days time. Uh, we know who is in charge of Hong Kong. And if you are a mainland company with a majority shareholder, which is the government, would you go to London to place your voice? I would say that that would only occur. Hong Kong role as the, the offshore, but we are offshore, we're not on China's, well, our whole system is independent, right? So our role would only be destroyed if our core system would be well, it's, it's, it's start to be a distrust. If the international investing community thought that Hong Kong's core system is no longer reliable in giving them fair rulings, then that would be the end. That would be the end of Hong Kong. And this is what leads to Singapore and leads to uh, to Britain. And you would think that why why would uh, I mean it's very strange for a government to keep a power that might be opposite to it. Because an independent court could be against its wishes. But to this year is the 800th year of the signing of the Magna Carta. Right? The Magna Carta was all about really rich people in Britain sick and tired of being taxed by the king. So they rebelled and made the king sign this particular document. Right? So you probably learned about all the noble things, all the human rights aspect of the Magna Carta. But the one undeniable, unintended consequence of the Magna Carta was, once the population knew the king couldn't tax and confiscate wealth freely, and they knew that the king can be forced to repay his debts, the king's borrowing costs actually went down after the signing of the Magna Carta. Right? Because people thought that, well, the parliament is here now, they can force the king to pay back his debts. So, I hope sincerely that whichever power is in charge of Hong Kong realize having an independent judiciary would actually help the financial industry. Okay? It would actually lower their, lower their costs. But that will be the uh, that will keep the future. Any other oh, I, I do have something. Uh, the Lion Rock Institute has an internship program uh, for individuals from secondary school uh, if they're interested in public policy. So if you want uh, the details, it will be on our website. You just search Lion Rock Institute. Right? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.